can hear me now. If you have your Bibles, please open them to the book of Ephesians, and today we're in chapter 3. Chapter 3 is one of the, is actually the most difficult passage in the book of Ephesians. When you go through books of the Bible as we do and just you cover everything, yet some chapters are just so easy or some passages and they just are, are wonderful to preach and others you kind of struggle with. And chapter 3 of Ephesians is one of those kind of difficult passages. If you read through your Bible, reading through uh, Ephesians, you'll love it until you get to chapter 3 and you go through the first part and you'll, you'll say to yourself, now, what did he just say? And then you go on and it gets great again. But that's where we are today. And uh, it, it's really not that hard to understand, but yet it is. But you have to understand exactly what Paul is doing here. In the previous chapter, at the end of chapter 2, he's talked about grace, which comes through Jesus Christ. He's talked about reconciliation, especially between Jews and Gentiles, because he's the apostle to the Gentiles. And he has told them, and I'll, I'll start quoting with verse 19 of chapter 2, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. He says to this Gentile church, you have now been reconciled, you've been saved, you've been brought into the kingdom of God, and you together, the entire church, is now a holy temple. You are being built into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. He says, for this reason, chapter 3, verse 1, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles. And I think what happens to Paul here is that he says, he says that, he writes that, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of you Gentiles, feels he needs to give some context to that statement. Because when you stop and think about it, he's in prison. The, the leader of their church, the key guy who started really and formulated their church and was the, the key apostle for them, is imprisoned. What's going to happen? He is likely to be killed. In fact, he was executed. What's going to happen to this church? What's going to happen to the church in general without the Apostle Paul? And he says he's in prison because of us, for the sake of the Gentiles. I believe Paul feels he needs to comment on that because he really picks up what he is going to say at the end of chapter 2 in verse 14 of chapter 3. For this reason, that whole chapter 1 through 13 is a parenthesis. He says, okay, you guys are now in Christ Jesus being built into a temple of God in the Holy Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles. Oh, wait a minute. I better say a few things about that. Then he gets down to 14. For this reason, this is what he's going to say, I bow my knees before the Father and gives this wonderful prayer. So what we have here, the reason why this passage is a little difficult is it's a parenthesis in his line of thought. And what he's trying to do is give the big picture. So they understand why he is in prison and why that's okay. You get it so far? Are you with me? It's really a big parenthesis. So he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, to be specific, that Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. So he's talking about himself a little. He wants to give them the big picture so they understand why he is imprisoned at this time. And so he tells about himself. Paul was an apostle, but he was not one of the twelve. Right? Those twelve apostles were with Jesus from the very beginning. When Judas betrayed Jesus and left, they had to appoint another one. They had to have twelve. Their rules for that were they had to be with Jesus from the very beginning for his entire ministry those apostles had to sit under the teaching of Jesus the entire time. They found two that qualified. They made their vote. They picked one of them to replace Judas. Paul wasn't one of those, yet he claimed to be an apostle over and over again to the Gentiles, and in many of his letters, he defends that. And here, he tells a little more about himself, why he's an apostle. 
Verse 2, if indeed you have heard the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, verse 3, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery which I wrote to you in brief. The Apostle Paul received some unique revelations from Jesus Christ himself. This doesn't happen to everybody. It happened to the Apostle Paul. And so he makes mention that the first one was on the Damascus Road when he was a persecutor of the church, one of the leading Jews, and his job was to find the Christians and round them up and throw them in jail. And he was on his way to Damascus to find those Christians that left Jerusalem and ran away to Damascus. And of course, you know the story, a funny thing happened. He met Jesus Christ on the road and was dropped flat on his face, blind as a bat, and told to go find uh, this guy in Damascus who would tell him all he needed to know, and he was baptized, and he, he actually had a little conversation with Jesus Christ on that Damascus road. And it was revealed to him as early as, as then on that road that he had been called by God to be one who brings the gospel to the Gentiles. What an unlikely candidate. He was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was one of the leading Jews He was pulled out of that, said, now you're going to be my main guy to the Gentiles. Up until this time, the people of God was all Jews. This was something brand new. That's why there are many struggles in that early church that we saw in the book of Acts as we went through that last year. So he receives this revelation. Not only that, he had a period of training. We know the Apostle Paul went off to Arabia for many years before he was back on the scene. We wonder, what did he do there? Well, I know one of the things that happened there is he had some Revelation. The living Savior, Jesus Christ, had some talks with the Apostle Paul. Turn with me very quickly to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you have your Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians, Paul is defending his apostleship because there were accusations, hey, you're not a real apostle. So he's defending them throughout chapter 11. He comes to chapter 12 and he says this, Boasting is necessary though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ. And by the way, you're going to see when we get to the, down a little bit that he's talking about himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know or out of body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Now let me give you my take on the third heaven, because there are three heavens talked about in Scripture. The first one is our physical atmosphere. The Bible talks about the birds of the heavens. In that realm, planes fly through the heavens. That's the first heaven. Second heaven, the abode of the spiritual beings, uh, angels and demons. There's a spiritual abode. It's not up in the sky, although we'd think of it that way. It's, it's, you think of another dimension is the best way to think of that spiritual realm. Very, very real all around us, but we don't see it, we don't experience it. By the way, Our world today exclusively believes, generally speaking, in the natural realm. Naturalism is the going religion of our world. It it rules our sciences. We don't believe there's a spiritual realm. Generally, I, I shouldn't say we. Our world generally does not believe there is a spiritual realm. There is only the natural scientific realm. We in the Christian faith believe there is a spiritual realm because if there wasn't, there wouldn't be God. So so we are are strong believers in the spirit realm. The second heaven is that place where angelic and demonic dwell. The third heaven, then, is the very throne room of God in his very presence. This is where John was taken up in the book of Revelation to see that throne room and those, those strange creatures worshiping up there. This, evidently, is where Paul was taken. He says, I know a man in Christ... 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know or out of body I do not know, God knows. Such a man was taken up into the third heaven, and I know how such a man, whether in body or apart from body I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man I will boast, but not on my own behalf I will not boast except in regard to my weakness. For if I do... If I do wish to boast, it will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave. But he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. So, This thorn in the flesh was because Paul had been up to the third heaven and heard and seen some things that people are not supposed to experience. And you know, how can you argue with the guy? You want to get into a theological debate with Paul? Thinking to win that? He could could stop and say, oh, by the way, 
Have you ever been to the third heaven? Okay. Uh, that would be that. So he says, to not, so I would not do that. There were some things that happened to him that kept him humble, some physical things. So there are many different uh, uh, theories on exactly what they were, but that's the reason. At any rate, he received these revelations. He did not learn at the feet of Jesus like those 12 apostles did. He learned it straight from the risen Savior, is really the point he is making here, that he received this revelation. And uh, it says in, in Galatians uh, chapter 1, verse 2, For I neither received it from men, nor was I taught it, but I received it through revelation of Jesus Christ. He got some direct teaching that most of us do not get. But that's the basis of his apostleship. It says in verse 4, By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Now, I love a good mystery. You know what makes mysteries good? If you read a book that's a mystery or watch a TV show that's a mystery... A good mystery will always surprise you at the end. There will always be something you didn't see coming. But then when you look back, you go, oh, I should have seen that coming. There were clues there, but it still kind of caught me off guard at the end. That's a good mystery, right? A bad mystery you have figured out long before it's over. There's a lot of those, by the way, on TV. Most shows are like that. You, you start watching for 10 minutes, you go, I know, this one's going to end, and sure enough, it does. Good guys always win because they have to be on again next week. At any rate... Uh, but this is a mystery. He's talking about the mystery of Christ, which means something that is now being revealed that people missed before, even though the clues were there. That's the story of Jesus Christ. Verse 5, And other generations were not made known to the sons of men, but has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Jesus Christ through the gospel. The ministry he has is one of this mystery of Jesus Christ that the world has, does not get. Even the Jewish people through whom Christ would come did not get it. They were surprised by it. It was a mystery that was now being revealed through the Holy Spirit to the apostles and prophets. This is the new thing that happened at Pentecost when the church was born. The brand new thing in God's program. He's unveiling here. He says, this is my ministry. This is what I've been called to do. We believe in the Christian faith that the one true God has intervened in human history. The one true God has revealed himself. There's a lot of quote-unquote religions out there. Mankind has a great ability to create their own religions. Look at all the cults that are out there. They're all over the place. But the one true God has at one point revealed himself entering history, speaking, first of all, significantly to a guy named Abraham, saying, follow me, and I will make you a great nation, and through you bless the whole world. This great nation became a people of Israel, the people who are called out to be holy, set apart for God, to reveal how holy God is by their lives, and the problem mankind has because of their sin through a sacrificial system, which was an atonement by somebody else paying the price. That's what the, the people of God were called to be different morally, to live different. This is the Jewish history. And to have a system that constantly revealed our sinfulness as opposed to the holiness of God and the needing of a death as the only way we can approach holy God. All pointing up towards, all moving towards God himself coming in the person of Jesus Christ and dying on the cross. The mystery, which is now revealed. What was, what was all that, those weird laws that the Jews had, and all that bloody sacrifice, day after day, animals being killed and blood being splashed on the altar. It was a bloody mess. What's with that? The mystery has been revealed. It was all moving toward Jesus Christ, showing the sinfulness of our sin, the holiness of God, and the need for death. Because God said to Adam and Eve, if you eat this, you'll surely die. The wages of sin are death, we are told in Romans. That was the great mystery. And now it has been revealed, and revealed that it wasn't just for the Jewish people, it is for the whole world. Gentiles. By the way, we're Gentiles. We are the Gentile church. We are here through the blood of Jesus Christ and nothing else. That's what makes us God's people. 
Verse 7, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. He says, why am I here? I was called by God. I am totally unworthy, but in spite of that, I'm the least of the people he would consider. He called me to this, and this is what I'm doing. I am, my job is to proclaim this mystery revealed the unfathomable riches of Jesus Christ to everybody, not just the Jews, to all of mankind. It was God's plan from the very beginning. The mystery is now being revealed, and if you look back at the clues, you should have seen it, right? The Old Testament is just filled with clues of Jesus Christ. The Bible that Peter had when he preached the gospel at Pentecost and beyond was nothing but the Old Testament. New Testament hadn't been written yet, and he proclaimed Jesus Christ through that Old Testament. The mystery revealed. Verse 9, and to bring the light, the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. This gets beyond the person of who this is to what now is the program. That the manifold wisdom of God, what is the manifold wisdom of God? I know what an exhaust manifold is, but I don't think that's the manifold wisdom of God, is it? What is he talking about here? So that the fullness of his plan, the full impact of God's plan from the very beginning will be revealed through the church. To these Gentile believers in Ephesus, he writes this letter and says, this is what it's all about. This is why I am in prison for you because I have been called to proclaim this and you are the ones. God has chosen to proclaim the fullness of his plan through the church. By the way, that is what we are as a church. We are called the body of Christ. In other words, Jesus Christ is still on this earth. Not as he first was. He is ascended up into heaven. But by his spirit in people, he is still here. He told his disciples, you're going to do greater things than I did. Now, they weren't going to do greater miracles. But Jesus can only be in one place at one time. The church is everywhere. The presence of God. Unveiling this mystery of who Jesus Christ is to a world that, that doesn't get it, that hasn't seen it yet. They've missed all the clues. And so he says, this is what the church is. In fact, look back in, in back chapter 1, verse 23 of this book of Ephesians, where he says what you are, church, Verse 22 and 23 says, He put all things in subjection under his feet, that's Christ, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Who are we as the church? The body of Christ. The fullness of him to proclaim the manifold wisdom of God. In other words, his plan from the very beginning. But here's what's weird. We think, oh yeah, we're supposed to proclaim that to this world. Well, yes, we are, but it goes much deeper than that. Here's what they needed to understand as they're trying to figure out how, how come it seems like we're losing? Why is Paul in prison? Why are all these people being persecuted? Why is the church not winning? Or so it seems. Look at what he says in verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenlies. Wow. In other words, this around us is not all there is. And this what's around us now is not even the most important. The real battle is taking place not on this realm, but in that heavenly realm, that kind of second heavenly realm, the, the heavenlies, the spiritual realm. Let me give you a preview of coming attractions as we go through Ephesians. And I know I've got to end here pretty soon if Scotty's going to have any time to do his thing. Uh, chapter 6, flip over to chapter 6. Verse 10, listen to what he says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's where our true battle lies. It's a spiritual battle. The spiritual realm really does exist, and there really is a bad guy called Satan who is trying to undermine God's work, and there really is a battle going on, and the front lines are the church. 
which is called to be a demonstration that those rulers in the heavenly places that think they're ruling and think they're winning are not. That's one of the reasons the church exists. We exist to show the heavenlies that they are in fact not really ruling at all. That they are not really winning at all, even though it seems like they are. Therefore, when you think of things like apostles thrown in jail, maybe to be executed, and every, is everything lost? No, this is a part of the program. There's something far more important going on than that thing there, something in the heavenlies. Strings are being pulled that we do not see. Do you believe that? You know, this is appropriate for us coming to an election year when everyone's getting really upset and really angry over a very, very divisive election. The big picture for us is, you know what? There's strings being pulled that we don't see. There's a program going on that has little to do with who wins or loses this election. This election, whoever wins will not gain any heavenly victories. But the church is here as a sign of the victory of Jesus Christ over the forces of darkness. So this is the big picture he's giving this church to help them put into place what is happening with him being in prison right now and ultimately to be executed, we know historically. And so he ends with the last few verses here. I better get back to I'm in Ephesians 6 here. There we go. No, let me try this one. Okay, the last few verses. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Jesus Christ. The plan is not failing. The plan is going along exactly as he has planned it, as he is executing it. In whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. In other words, don't lose your boldness by what happens around you. You have access to the throne of God, to the one who has already won the victory on the cross. And he concludes in verse 13, Therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf. They are for your glory. Me is part of the plan. I'm just a guy who was called to do this job, and once I do my job, I'm done. And that's, I'm not what's important. It's Jesus Christ who is building his church. Do you get it? Do you get the parentheses? So he says at the end of chapter 2, you guys are the, being built into the dwelling of God in the Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Oh, let me explain something so you understand that. Here's where I'm a prisoner. Don't worry about it. Then he gets down to 14. For this reason, I bow my knees, and we're going to pick it up right there. God is in control. It might seem like our world's falling apart. It might seem like our lives are falling apart. There's things going on that we don't even see, and there's a program being accomplished, and the victory has been won in Jesus Christ, and we can have boldness, and we have confident access to his presence at any moment. The true ruler of the world, even though it seems like the forces of wickedness are winning, the true ruler of the world is for us, and we are for him, and we are, in fact, the sign of his victory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we stand in awe of this mystery, and it's hard to understand. We don't get it all, but we do know enough to know that you gained the eternal victory on the cross, and we who have put our faith in you are with you in that. Lord, help us to see with eternal eyes. Help us to put into perspective the things that happen on this world. Not that we should just throw, write off this world and not participate. We are called to be citizens, but help us not lose heart by what we see happening, knowing that there's a greater plan being accomplished. Thank you. We praise you, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.